Okay, so I'm Robert Schock, and I'm very pleased to be at the first annual Parapod, and I'm going to talk about my work on the Great Sphinx, Gebekli Tepe, our sun, and I call this uh, exploring a 12,000 year old mystery, as you will see. And I really do appreciate being here. I know Tony Sweet is not here at the moment, but I want to thank him personally for inviting me here. And let me just jump right into it. So I have been working on the Sphinx, and I've been working in Egypt and on ancient civilizations for over three decades now. I'm a scientist, my PhD is in geology and geophysics, and I was always interested in ancient civilizations, but I really did not get involved in them seriously as part of my research until I went to Egypt in 1990. And why did I go to Egypt in 1990? Because I had met this man in the late 1980s, John Anthony West. Some of you may have heard of him or know of his work. And he had, absolutely, give him an applause, the late John Anthony West. He became a very close friend, a very close colleague. Um, and I could talk for hours just about John Anthony West and our relationship and all the things we did together. But I want to mention just one thing right now, which is that he had been influenced by the European philosopher, mathematician, esotericist, practicing at the time alchemist, R.A. Schwaller de Lubitsch. And Schwaller de Lubitsch had gone specifically to Egypt in the 1930s or so to study the temple that's now known as the Temple of Luxor, and Schwaller actually indicated through his mathematical analysis of it, his deep architectural analysis of it, that it's incredibly more sophisticated, and he suggested that this was just the tip of the proverbial iceberg, that ancient Egypt itself was much more sophisticated than anyone had ever imagined up to that time. And furthermore, that this knowledge went back to a much earlier, much more remote period. And this is a quote from John Anthony West, just before I met him, he published this in what was known as the Traveler's Key to Ancient Egypt. So quoting John Anthony West, Schwaller de Lubitsch observed that in his opinion, the dramatically severe erosion on the body of the Great Sphinx could not be the result of wind and sand, as is universally assumed, but was rather the result of water. Geologists agree that it, in the not so distant past, Egypt was subjected to severe flooding. This period is usually held to coincide with the melting of the ice from the last ice age, the last ice age, and West gave it the um, date, which was correct back in 1985, of circa 15,000 to 10,000 BC. General concept of the origins of civilization, the beginnings of civilization, were really set out for all to um, uh, see, should we say, and popularized by a man named V. Gordon Child. So he died in 1957, but to this day, in the standard textbooks used in colleges, universities, high schools, etc., and I, every time I say this, I look it up every year to make sure I'm still correct, he is still mimicked. He is still discussed as if he is the end-all and be-all dogma. And basically, his concept was that there were fundamental stages of humanity that we began as savager, savages, savagery, hunters, gatherers, foragers. Then we slowly elevate, we slowly graduate, if you would, or evolve to barbarism with early cultivation agriculture, for him it was very important that agriculture had to be developed and that allowed people to settle down in little villages. This he called the Neolithic Revolution or the Agricultural Revolution, he and other people thinking along the same lines. And then finally from this would evolve true civilization, high culture with monumental architecture, uh, sophisticated technology, literacy that is writing, written, records and cities. And this stage was first reached about 3500 BCE, according to Child and his colleagues and to most people to this day in academia, about 3500 BCE in Mesopotamia, 
known as the urban revolution. And I'm here to tell you that basically this chronology is incorrect and there are profound implications to it being incorrect. So, so one suggestion is that the age of Leo, when is that? That's about 12,000 years ago, which is compatible with my seismic data, my geological analysis, and I wasn't trying to get the age of Leo, it just worked out that way, but that the Sphinx was looking at essentially itself in the sky. Uh, that the major pyramids on the Giza Plateau correlate with the belt stars of Orion, but the correlation is not perfect in 2500 BC, it's not perfect today. When is it perfect? About 10,000, he did dated it to 10,500 BC, which is really close to my dating on totally separate evidence for the Sphinx. So it all seems to start to correlate. Also remember, the head of the Sphinx is what? Too small for the body? I hope you can see that. And I pointed this out to Egyptologists back in the 1990s, and a lot of them said, oh, that's crazy. The Sphinx is the greatest structure, greatest statue that's ever been uh, carved. But when you start looking at it, and they admit it, when they start looking at Sphinxes that are known elsewhere, they have much bigger heads relative to the Great Sphinx. And we postulated, John Anthony West and I, that, yeah, this is not the original head. And I'm convinced 100% it's not the original head. Maybe it was once a Sphinx, but maybe it was once a lion. And that was actually my best guess until a few years ago, that it was a male lion, the head had been eroded down and then recarved into a human head to turn it into a Sphinx. And what we've learned recently, and this is work I did with um, uh, my colleague, Dr. Manu Saifzadeh, and also Robert Bouval was involved in it, is that the Sphinx, it turns out, we're convinced, was the lioness Mehit, or Mehet. And the Sphinx was originally not a Sphinx, as we think about, but a female lion. Not a male lion, but a female lion who was guarding an archive, which turns ties in with my original size work, work as I'll talk about in a second. Um, and literally, the Egyptologists had often questioned why wasn't the Sphinx talked about in the early hieroglyphic literature? Why wasn't there any mention of the Sphinx? Well, there are mentions of the Sphinx, but not as a Sphinx, as a lioness. Um, so it solves that, and also I want to point out that part of the um, solution to that was ties in with this statue of this person, Hemi Unu, who was a fourth dynasty official, high official, who lived just before or around the period of supposedly when the Sphinx was carved according to classical Egyptologists. So that's important. He's about 25... 2600 BCE, somewhere in that range. And he held a number of titles. He was a very high official. And one of his titles is shown here in hieroglyphics, and it includes the Lioness Mehit. The Lioness Mehit. But the Lioness Mehit and his title has this weird bent rod sticking out of her back. Why would you have a rod sticking into your back? And what Dr. Manu Saifzadeh first realized and uh, hypothesized, and I think we've now made, he's made a very good case and we've made a very good case, this bent rod is a key. It represents a physical key. And what Hemi, Nunu had, Hemi Unu had was, as a title, was that he was king, or not king, uh, he was a chief of the scribes and he held a special key. Uh, and when we do a translation of this, we can say that he was the overseers of the scribes of the king. That's what's being referred to here with an inkwell, etc. This is uh, Egyptian hieroglyphics for um, a scribe. And he was a king's and he was master of the key to the lioness. So he was the master, this is what this represents, to the key to the lioness. Or, to put it in more um, 
poetic terms, he was the king's chief librarian, more or less the scribes of records, and guardian of the royal archives of Mehit. That this represents a key to a lioness who's guarding an archive. And it turns out, once you realize that and you think about that, you start looking elsewhere. This is from the um, so-called First Dynasty. This is about 3000 to 3100 BCE, a good 500 years or more before supposedly when the Sphinx was carved. What does it have? There she is. There's the lioness with, again, the key in her back. Here's another, this may in fact be the lioness too, with what? An archive underneath. Or if you look at, if you look at the Stella, the so-called Tutmosis IV, dream Stella, that sits to this day between the paws of the Sphinx, we have actually two Sphinxes, and that's another issue totally, is there a second Sphinx, as well as the Sphinx that we all know. But what is the Sphinx doing? Sitting above what looks like a building? No. I believe now, based on the evidence, that that is an archive, a chamber, under the Sphinx that was holding very, very, is still to this day, I suspect, holding very ancient records. Um, so we have it all together, putting it together, that the Sphinx was a lioness guarding an archive underneath her. And this is where I find it very personally interesting, at least for me, 1995, so several years later, enters this man who unfortunately has passed away. Uh, he was per Herr Professor Dr. Klaus Schmidt with the German Archaeological Institute. Here I'm talking to him on site of Gebekli Tepe. And he started excavating Gebekli Tepe in 1995, so three years, three years after, three years after that debate at the American Association for the Advancement of Science, this was technically it had been discovered earlier, but people didn't realize how old it was because they hadn't excavated it. But he realized how old it was. This is in southeastern Turkey. It's actually near the traditional home of the biblical patriarch Abram or Abraham, which is in Urfa. And he was talking about building phases going back to 10,000 BC. He said initially 10,000 to 8,000 BCE. And lo and behold, that's what I've been talking about, had been talking about for several years, that the Sphinx goes back to that earlier period also. So Gebekli Tepe is in northern Mesopotamia. Of course, the Sphinx is down here at Giza. And his initial date was even older. This is the initial dates. His initial date for Gebekli Tepe was even older than my initial date for the Sphinx. Now we can push them all back to the end of the last ice age, roughly 10,000 BCE. Uh, I also want to point out, for those that are interested, the Gebekli Tepe is in northern Mesopotamia between the Euphrates and Tigris. So that is actually where the Judaic Muslim Christian religions, the Abrahamic religions, place Eden, the general Eden area. Garden of Eden would have been within the general Eden area. Just a side note, but maybe there's some significance to that. Gebekli Tepe consists of about 20 or more megalithic stone structures. Um, only four or so have been fully excavated, portions of other ones to this day. Uh, the number of them have been found geophysically, which is very close to my heart since I'm a geophysics, a geophysicist in part, geologist and geophysicist, so we know it's a huge site. Only a small percentage of it has been excavated so far. This is uh, in 2010 or so. I've been there, Katie, my wife and I have been there a number of times, so I'm going to show you pictures from different um, times. This is looking south. It's at a higher elevation looking south over the plain. That is actually Syria in the background. It's on the close to the Turkish-Syrian border. And this is a modern picture, when I say modern, 2020, this particular picture. It's now a UNESCO site, a UNESCO World Heritage Site. The 
Turkish government realizes how important it is, the world realize, realizes how important it is, it's really changing history, so they've built a wonderful canopy over it, and you, they have a walk around it so you can see it well, and um, it's very safe, it's, uh, they, they take incredible care of it, um, and you know, they want to protect this because they know how important it is. In some ways, I think they're sort of competing now with Egypt because Egypt has the monuments and the Sphinx and the pyramids. They have Gobekli Tepe. But to know the real story of civilization, you need to take it both into account. Here I am in 2010, May of 2010. You can see what Gobekli Tepe consists of are these rings of pillars T-pillars, they're called, um, stone circles. People can think about Stonehenge, but it's not like Stonehenge because the pillars are beautifully carved with carvings on their faces. Uh, this is me in January 2020. It was a cold day in January. It gets very cold there in the winter. Uh, but here you can see uh, some of the pillars in the background. And this will just give you, I'm going to flip through them just to give you a sense of the site. And this is uh, when we were there in 2020, just before the pandemic broke out. We'll be going back now this August, as I mentioned, anyone wants to join us. And it's a really incredible, beautiful site. This is an older photograph. This, at one point, they were starting to crate up some of the pillars, um, not to move them, just to protect them but then they've taken the crates off again. You can see how these pillars are beautifully carved. You can see the animals carved in them. Some of them, this is not attached to the pillar. This is carved right into the um, rock. This, so this is all one piece is what I'm saying. One piece of carving, so it had to be planned out. Uh, there you see some close-ups of uh, some of the pillars. And this is sometimes referred to as the beast beautifully carved um, uh, it's, it's just incredible and it's really out of place out of time for 10,000 just think round numbers 10,000 BC uh, some Egyptologists some archaeologists I've spoken to off the record have said to me that if they found this in isolation and could not date it otherwise stylistically they would put it 600 BC or 1000 BC not 9,000 years earlier. More carvings is sometimes referred to as a vulture pillar. This um, one interpretation is that the sun, actually sun, uh, electrically charged particles, plasma, frequencies, things you've maybe heard about recently at this conference, they all tie in with Gobekli Tepe. Um, that would be another two hours for me to talk about that. Uh, more of the pillars, just to flip through these quickly, uh, just to give you a sense of what the site looks like. That's actually the original pillar that the uh, landowners found at the time. Uh, when I say they found it, they, it was buried, totally, and they thought they hit a rock they wanted to remove. So they were trying to chip away the rock, and you can see how they broke it. They didn't mean to do that. And then they realized there's something big underneath there. And that's when yeah, it was really acknowledged. Another pillar, they're just really incredible. And some of them are anthropomorphic. So if you look at this, they have arms. This is actually an arm carrying a little animal, like a little dog type animal or fox under, um, sort of nestled in the, um, under the arm. There you see more, just to give you a view of it. And they are set very shallowly in the bedrock, but they're oriented in the bedrock. So they are carved and they were oriented very, very precisely. And you can see that, and I'll come back to that point, because they're not just moved, put in willy-nilly, and they can't be moved once they're in. They knew exactly what they were doing, and they were orienting them. And they did amazing engineering. So this is the bedrock, and actually they carved the base, these little type of animals on it, which some people think are, you know, animals that are no longer exist, they're extinct, they go back to that early period. And then here you can see, in part, how they would cut a notch to set the pillar into, so they were very precisely aligning them. 
And Gebekli Tepe is up here, and it's, as I said, the area that some people think of as Eden, and it's near the modern city of Urfa, which also plays a role here, because Urfa is known as the um, city of prophets. It's the place where Abraham, according to the traditions there, lived as a child and preached and, and uh, uh, spoke against idols and for the true one God. And this is known as the Pools of Abraham. And what's important here for our story is that during construction projects, they often hit very ancient archaeological layers down to Gebekli Tepe time, 10,000 or so BC, um, 12,000 year old layers, and one that they found very close to the pools here, I mean literally just uh, hundreds of meters, was this statue that's now often known as Urfa Man. This goes back to Gebekli Tepe times. This you can think of as how the Gebekli Tepe people visualize themselves or carve themselves, not as like these crude cavemen type, but very, I think, very sophisticated, very elegant, if you would. Um, and this is Urfa Man in the new museum that has been created for many of these artifacts. He has a room unto himself. Himself, you can't, you can only gaze at him from a distance now. Back in the old little museum, you could get right up to him. I mean, there was a plate of glass, but otherwise, you, I only show this so you can see how big he is. He's basically, life-size or more than life-size. I mean, he's an incredible statue. Here's another picture of him when they painted the wall behind him. And yesterday, she used the analogy vomit, that the sun vomits on the earth. Well, it's a crude analogy, but maybe um, explicit. The sun can go undergo major solar outbursts, ejecting electrically charged particles, traveling at relativistic speeds. That means very good percentage of the speed of light. So hitting, impacting the Earth, impacting our magnetosphere, destroying the ozone layer, causing massive levels of radiation over short periods of time on the surface, on dramatically changing the climate. This could literally melt glaciers and end an ice, end an ice age. You can literally think of it in some cases like huge lightning bolts coming down and hitting the Earth in places, setting fires, um, causing all kinds of destruction. People don't want to think that this could be the case, but it is, and we have evidence for it. In fact, all the geological evidence now, ice core data, cement core data, lunar data, indicates this happened 9700 BCE, I'm convinced, looking at the data. And this is actually not super new, I just want to point out where people have talked about before, there was an astrophysicist, Thomas Gold, who talked about this back in the 1960s. He said, this is a partial quote from him, a big solar outburst, the, during a big solar outburst, the Earth's magnetic field could clearly not hold up the incoming gas. That's what we now call plasma or charged particles. And it would indeed drive down to the atmospheric level. It would take the form of a series of sparks burning for extended periods of time and carrying currents of hundreds of millions of amperes, causing, he said, massive destruction on the surface of the planet. He suggested looking for vitrification, basically melted rock. And we found that. He found it looking at the Apollo missions and the data that was brought back from the Apollo missions to the moon. He found just that type of evidence, as he said here, of a solar outburst in geologically recent times, read that as 9700 BCE, end of the last ice age. Uh, and we find evidence of this on Earth, right in Egypt. This is from the Geological Museum in Cairo, a specimen of what's known as the Libyan Desert Glass. Uh, it's approximately, 20, covers approximately 2,500 square kilometers, the strewn field of it. Traditional view of this from my geological colleagues is that it was a big comet that hit. But there's no evidence of the extraterrestrial comet or meteorite or that type of thing. 
Um, there's no crater to go with it, but I believe it's explained cogently by a major solar outburst that was literally touching down in that region, melting the sand and forming what's known as the desert glass. It is a form of natural glass. We have another one here, the Dockley glass in the Western desert in Egypt. And this may not look like pretty glass, but that's what it is. It's, uh, it's uh, natural glass where the surface of the rock has been melted and bubbled and recongealed. And studies have been done of this, and I won't belabor this now, but um, a guy named Michael Joseph, for instance, studied um, fulgurites. Fulgurites are where you know that in modern times, a very strong bolt of lightning hit the ground, and you can look at what was formed while the rock was melted and then recongealed. And then when he studied these and looked at things like the dock lake glass, he said, well, you have all the same properties in these glasses, so we have to consider they're not comets or meteorites. They're from something like super lightning hitting, more or less a solar outburst. And even things like shock lamellae and crystals, or uh, what they call uh, shocked crystals and nanodiamonds, you can get that from a solar outburst or from lightning type features. Uh, I've looked at this myself in different places. So in Scotland, you get what are known as the vitrified forts, which have vitrification on them. And these have been dated back now to the end of the last ice age, some of them, even though they were being reused. And this is something we see around the ancient world, that structures were being used and reused and reused. So yes, they will find things here that are just 1,500 years old from the Dark Ages. And sure, people were living there, but they were re-inhabiting much earlier structures. And you find uh, very good examples of vitrified glass here. I'm holding some. Uh, to show what it looks like. And you even have evidence of this right on the Giza Plateau. The Sphinx itself has a history going back to ancient dynastic times of having been hit by, quote, lightning. Uh, so we have, for instance, the inventory stella, and I like to take people to see this. This is the temple of Isis. Most people don't see this in Egypt. And this is where the stella was found. And on it is an inscription. This is just outside, or just in the shadow of the Great Pyramid, right on the plateau. And there's an inscription there. And this is um, the great Egyptologist Salim Hassan from the middle of the last century. He talked about how this inscription says that the Sphinx was hit by a thunderbolt. And that Khufu, who supposedly built the Great Pyramid, went to see the Sphinx. Well, the Sphinx wasn't supposed to have been built when Khufu was around, because it was supposed to have been built after, or carved after the Great Pyramid. But this inscription says how he went to see the Sphinx, he went to see the damage by the thunderbolt, et cetera, et cetera, and how the headdress was knocked off or damaged. And Salim Hassan says that, well, actually, there is evidence on the Sphinx that it was hit by something. Um, but he thinks it wasn't hit by lightning um, during Khufu's time. He thinks it was probably struck by lightning, but not when, um, he says, there is not a particle of evidence to show that this accident happened in the reign of Khufu. I agree, it's not the reign of Khufu. Khufu was going to see something much more ancient, much more sacred that they recognized that there had been this plasma strike thousands and thousands of years earlier. That may be why the Giza Plateau is sacred in the first place. It's where a god touched the earth. It's where the sun came down and literally manifested on earth. Um, so I think it all gets really interesting and profound. This is me with one of the um, pieces of evidence of a plasma strike vitrified rock right on the plateau. This is the second pyramid. And um, so we're at the base of the second pyramid. And there you can see some of it. It's really extensive. Uh, this, you don't get this from building little campfires or something on the rock. You can't get even close to the heat you need uh, to do this, especially when you see that this penetrates down into the subsurface. And in some of the um, shafts, you can see how it goes down numerous meters. Uh, there I am with it again. 
this just if you know the Giza Plateau, this is again that's some what's known as a mortuary temple. Just off um, to the right would be the second pyramid, and here we have a close up of it. So there's a lot more evidence though, and I want to bring in something else besides sediment cores and lunar data and vitrification. A really important component to this was brought to light by this man. This is Dr. Anthony Peratt, and he's a plasma physicist. He worked for many decades, and he's still associated with Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico. He's a plasma physicist who looks at very high energy plasma physics, and he found that when you look at petroglyphs or rock art, incredibly ancient rock art from the end of the last ice age, you find all the same diagnostic shapes pictured on the rock art that you would see in the sky during a major solar outburst when plasma, these electrically charged particles at high intensity and high speed hit the magnetosphere, hit the atmosphere. Think of the aurora borealis, borealis, but on steroids, as people like to say. Also would come down to low latitudes, even to the equator. When you have a major solar outburst, it would it surround the entire Earth. And he found that it would take on diagnostic shapes like stick figure man, um, which he's showing here in some of his diagrams. Again, think of the aurora borealis be becoming much more distinct. These are some photographs in the modern day, but we don't have anything as distinct as it. You can start to see, this is known as a sprite, how it starts to form shapes like that. Um, and these are some of the figures. And he found that there are a number of distinguishing features, three of which I want to point out. Stick figure men with dots on their sides. Well, real humans don't have dots on their sides, but if you're looking at plasma configurations, it's known as what's, it's what's known as synchrotron radiation from swirling electromagnetic fields and the particles captured in them. Um, so it's very good plasma physics that they're depicting. Stick figure men with so-called bird's heads, because um, some of the plasma takes on bird head shapes. Well, we see bird men throughout the very ancient world, the depiction of bird men. Um, and then one more, uh, cascading donut-like cylindrical shapes. And we see that depicted throughout the ancient world. So Anthony Peratt, Dr. Anthony Peratt, found these around the world. He and his team have found them in over 130 countries around the world. And consistently, he finds ones with these anomalies. If you think they just are primitive stick figure men, well, we don't have little dots floating on our sides. These are plasma shapes. He's convinced of it and he can see the orientation and they all orient to the same point in the sky from around the globe where the plasma was coming in. Here we have ones with the bird's heads on them, etc. So this is not evidence that would support a comet or a meteorite or asteroid. It supports a solar outburst. That's what I was referring to in part when I was saying there's evidence supporting a solar outburst that can't be explained otherwise to the best of our knowledge. Here's more from Dr. Parrott. Uh, more, I love this one in particular with the bird head, um, the stick figure with the bird head. Uh, and here's some that Katie and I and John Anthony West, he was still alive at the time, we did a conference in Norway, and I insisted I wanted to see some of the ancient pet petroglyphs from the end of the last ice age, same diagnostic shapes. Uh, another place is Easter Island. Everyone knows Easter Island, I think, from the big moai, the heads and torsos. Well, they're wonderful, they're magnificent. Um, but for our story, we have something else that's even more magnificent. And remember, Easter Island is this little island in the Pacific, isolated supposedly uh, with the Moai, but they also have birdmen. Remember the birdmen I was just referring to. And they have the birdmen, and I think these birdmen these are nice, stylized birdmen now, but they go back, I think, to the concept, to the earlier period of the end of the last ice age. These are traditions that were being passed down. And we also see at Easter Island, uh, 
the moai, but look, they are very similar in some respects with the hands towards the uh, navel, that type of thing, as what we see in Turkey. Uh, here's what's known as a female moai, and here's Urfa man, just for comparison. And what Easter Island is also very well known for in some circles, and I think one of the most fascinating things, is the so-called Rongo Rongo script, which is this hieroglyphic script which no one really understands or understood until I think now. And again, Katie keeps me on my toes. We were looking at things. I was looking at, uh, we were looking at uh, petroglyphs from Anthony Parrot and uh, uh, global plasma discharges, etc. And Katie says to me, don't these Rongo Rongo characters look like plasma discharge images? And the petroglyphs, the pet, and I couldn't, I was stunned. I write about this in Forgotten Civilization. I was really stunned by it, and I am convinced uh, she's right. And Dr. Anthony Parrott and his team are convinced she's right because they said to us privately after we published this that they had discovered the same thing, but they hadn't published on it purposefully. Um, but what you get are the same bird-headed men with stick figure shapes and the stick figure shapes and, you know, uh, the same uh, cascading cylindrical shapes, etc. in the Rongo Rongo. So what we suggest is, at least in the original form, this is essentially a scientific text of what's happening in the sky at that earlier period. Now, these are carved on wood. These do not go back 12,000 years. I'm not saying that whatsoever, but, but on the other hand, do we have Plato's original manuscripts, or Aristotle's, et cetera? No, we only have copies of copies of copies of copies of copies, et cetera. That's what we have here. Doesn't mean the information doesn't go back to that earlier period. And just as a side note, uh, everyone's heard of the Nazca geoglyphs. They seem to show this also. So it seems to be some common themes. And we see it, as I said, in Turkey. The Easter Islanders even had legends about how the Moai looked up to the sky. And they had legends of, about King Roko Roko Hital, one of the legendary kings, how in his reign, the uh, sky fell. It fell onto the earth. And then uh, the people cried out, the sky is fallen in the days of King Roko Roko Hital. He took hold. He waited a given time. The sky returned. It went away and it stayed up there. But this is what you would think, see, I think it's being described poetically, but what you would see with a plasma solar outburst, that you'd have the sky. It would seem like it's falling. All this havoc is occurring but then it goes away again when the sun calms down. So we have that happening. We have that at the end of the last ice age. This is a paper Parat um, talked about, evidence for an intense solar outburst in prehistory. He didn't date it precisely, I'm dating it precisely based on further evidence in 9700 BC. So here you have what now I think is our new revised timeline of the great space Gebekli Tepe representing true civilization that was snuffed out by solar outbursts. We went into a dark age, which Katie and I have named Siddha, or the solar-induced dark age. That's a subtitle in the subtitle of my book now, because a second revised edition came out in 2021. The first edition was 2012. Added another 150 pages, notes throughout, another 40. Uh, photographs. I'm not saying this to sell books. I'm saying this to get make sure if you do want to get the book and look at all this data and more, get the new revised edition, or if you have the old edition, buy the new edition too. Um, because I've, I'm very passionate that this is information people need to know. And it ties in, I think, with the concept of Plato and Atlantis, etc. This was referring to. But bringing up to the modern time, um, the solar outburst des describes what happened at the end of the last ice age with a melting of the glaciers. It had actually would set off earthquakes. I talk about that in the new book and why, and that's correlated with solar activity. You would get huge 
flooding, not just from rising sea levels, but because you're melting all this ice and water, you put huge amounts of moisture into the atmosphere that comes out as incredible precipitation, causing flash floods. We know what that's like for parts of right now in the America here. I mean, I, I just realized I'm in California because um, we flew in from Boston. Uh, so you know what that's like. Well, what caused the initial rains on the Great Sphinx? I think it goes back to that period. Um, it would knock out the ozone layer, stratospheric ozone, cause high levels of radiation on the Earth, high enough that large mammals could die within a week or so. I've talked to a number of physicists about this. Um, and it would incinerate things on Earth. In the modern world, it would just bring down all our technology. I mean, you know, forget it. Uh, how do you survive this? The way you can survive it, and the way humanity, I believe, survived it in pockets was literally by going underground. So a good example of that is going underground, for instance, in Turkey. This is in Cappadocia. Uh, some things could not go underground. So we have, at the end of the last ice age, and a number of papers have been written about this in the scientific literature, uh, about huge synchronous extinction, in this case of North America's Pleistocene mammals. That's more or less the end of the last ice age, and how they all go extinct. This is uncalibrated, so that's why it tests 10,000. This is basically 10,000. BCE um, at the end of the last ice age because they couldn't escape. What could escape smaller animals that could go into nooks and crannies and go into little burrows and underground? Some things like maybe some big cave there, some of them could survive because they naturally lived in cave. Um, so you get these massive extinctions. You also get evidence, and this is work that was done by um, the Austrian Heinrich and Ingrid Kusch. They explored all these caves um, and tunnels, narrow tunnels that, yes, date back 12,000 years to the end of the last ice age. They can't explain them. Why would people all of a sudden be spending all the time and energy to do this tunneling? Well, I think we know why now, because of the solar outburst. If it were a comet or a meteorite or an impactor, you wouldn't be doing this. It would just crush you. It would crush these caves. Um, down, but it would protect you beautifully from a solar outburst. You see this literally around the world. In Great Britain, you have all these barrows, as they call them. In Easter Island, you have um, artificial houses that were, yes, reused later for other things. All these structures were reused later. Um, but I think their origin goes back to this period. In many places, including Easter Island, the there's a tradition of living in caves and having, at times, to go under cave, into caves because of the havoc occurring on the surface. Here we're going into one. Uh, these are basically lava tubes that were then enhanced for utilization by humans. That's Katie in one of them. There I am coming out of them. And notice how they built up the entrances to protect them. So there's just the narrowest of entrance. Well, that's what you would do if you wanted to protect yourself from the radiation and the havoc that's occurring. Um, here, uh, Mesa Verde. And this is Easter Island down in the bottom corner. Or we see we went to Malta, Katie and I, and I was most interested in the caves there, which have the same tradition going back to the earliest period of habitation on the island. Uh, we see this example from Ajanta, India, where, yes, these were later recarved and used by you know, Buddhist monks or whatever, but the tradition and the origins, I think, goes back much, much earlier. And the, maybe the quintessential examples are in Cappadocia, in Turkey, not far from Urfa, not far from the region of Gebekli Tepe in Anatolia. This is when we take balloon rides over it. You can see it beautifully, how they carved into the rock um, to protect themselves. And they have the famous underground cities like Kamakali um, that you can go into. We have eight or more stories with perfect ventilation, incredibly sophisticated. Why would you do this? And I don't believe for a second it was to hide from the enemies, because the enemies would know exactly where it is, because you'd have huge piles of rubble on the surface. But you don't. Why? Because these things are so old, that's all eroded away now. 2,000, 3,000 years, it would not all erode away. Um, 
as a geologist. But yes, they were reused later, so you find things in them from a later period. Uh, but I think they go back, the origins go back to this earlier period. Uh, here's another one, Darian Kuyu, where you can see the same thing. There I am. And it's just incredible and incredible that they did this. They did it for a reason. Um, other evidence that uh, population, this is one of the few places where a uh, human population of substantial size could survive. Here's Quebecle Tepe, here's the Cappadocia, Anatolian region. So I know I've more than run out of time, uh, but I apologize uh, for that, and I hope you found this of interest, and thank you very much.